My name is Aurelio Garcia Ribeiro, and I have been a product manager for the Java Platform Group at Oracle since before the launch of JDK 7. Last week, we released Java Management Service, a new offering available to Oracle Java SE subscribers and users of Oracle Cloud that will help you manage Java runtimes. But why would you want to manage your Java runtimes? Why would you not simply run the program on whatever Java version it shipped with? Is it really that important to update if things are working? Glad that you asked. Let's see why you would like to keep your runtimes up to date. A running Java application is the result of the collaboration of different components. We all think of the developers as the ones that write the application, and rightly so, since they are the ones that provide concrete solutions to specific problems. But no modern developer writes all of their code. Developers rely on third-party libraries and frameworks to handle some of the most complex or specialized part of the application. A modern application can rely on tens or even hundreds of third-party libraries. Then there is the Java runtime itself, which, at a high level, is comprised of a Java virtual machine and a collection of common libraries. The JDK libraries free developers from having to learn and optimize common tasks like implementing collections, opening files, or establishing connections to other systems. They also provide a unified base of features that work the same across all supported platforms. The developer code and the third-party libraries are under the control of the Java developer. They can only be updated when a new version of the program gets created and distributed. The Java runtime, on the other hand, is provided by Oracle or from whomever builds your Java runtime and lets systems administrators update an application independently of the developer. Let's see an example. If back on the days of JDK 1.42, I had written a Java application that used the JDK libraries to establish a secure connection, it would have used SSL3, which was, at the time, the industry standard. By updating to JDK 6, the system administrator in charge of this application will make the application switch to TLS 1.0 without the developer having to change a single line of code or even without having to recompile anything. Once you move to JDK 16, the same application will connect with TLS 1.3. And in this way, an application can use an encryption that didn't even exist when it was written, all thanks to being able to update the runtime separately from the application. Having the runtime be independent of the application does raise some issues. It is common to have a system-wide Java runtime meant to be used by many Java applications that run on that system. What's more, it's not one version that it's normally installed, but usually several versions. You might have JDK 8, 11, and 16 installed right next to each other. Since the runtime is not tightly coupled with the application, it can be difficult to know which application is using each runtime. If you simply scan a hard drive, you will probably find all of the Java runtimes, and you might even be able to find a list of Java applications that are hosted on that system. But you will need to examine in detail how each application is launched to find out which application is using which runtime. There could also be a number of runtimes not being used by any application. Perhaps all of the applications that use JDK 8 have been migrated to JDK 11, but you could still be updating JDK 8 simply because you aren't sure if some application still needs it. It would be nice to have a way of linking applications to runtimes. Let's put a pin on that idea for a little while. We have all heard that it's a good idea to run on an up-to-date version of Java. But what exactly does that mean? Should we all be running on JDK 16? Why would we have long-term support releases if this was the case? When you see the JDK support roadmap, you normally see something like this, with some releases designated as long-term support with a lot of overlap between them. If we look at where we are today, we have four supported releases, 16, 11, 8, and 7. But what does being supported mean? How often are new updates released on those versions? We can turn this abstract roadmap into a more concrete list of releases. There is a page, java.com slash releases, which lists all of the Java versions released. It has the option of showing them in a month-by-month -month matrix, which conveniently looks like our support roadmap if you stand it up. This makes the roadmap more concrete. Oracle produces quarterly updates for every release that hasn't reached the end of support. JDK 8 is already over five years old. It's not one of the new releases. But 8U291 is less than two months old, 
So that version is clearly up to date. If you look at this list and ask yourself, of the highlighted releases, which one has the most functionality, the later features? The answer is JDK 16. It has more features that include things like the new record classes, which earlier versions don't. But if I were telling you to run on an up-to-date version and you had to choose amongst the highlighted versions, you should choose 8U291, which is the only release amongst the ones I highlighted that has not have a newer version available. Any of the releases at the top row will do. All of those releases were made available on the same day, and that wasn't a coincidence. Security fixes are addressed in all supported releases at the same time, and since it is possible that a security vulnerability is present in more than one release, it's important to have them all released simultaneously. But all of those releases, there are only two that you could use that will allow you to remain in the same release for a long time. JDK 7 is scheduled to reach end of support in July of 2022, and JDK 16, not being a long-term support release, will reach end of support even sooner. There will be no more updates for JDK 16 after JDK 17 releases in September. JDK 8 and 11 are your current choices for long-term support. JDK 17 due in September would also be a good release to stay on for a while, as it will receive updates for at least eight years. It will be relatively simple to move from JDK 16 to JDK 17, which is the next LTS, given how similar the code base between those two releases is. Should be clear now that when you have a Java program running, you have two options when you're using a particular Java version. You can upgrade to a newer release family, or you can update within the same release family. That is, apply the newer updates for the same release that you were using before. The two choices are valid, but they have different points to consider. Upgrading to a new version is moving to a different release, and it's more complex than just updating the runtime. You should consider upgrading when the new version offers some advantage to you. For example, if the new version uses less memory, or if there has been some performance improvement in an area that your program relies heavily on. You should also consider upgrading if the version that you're relying on is approaching end of life and you need your software to work after that. This is where the users of JDK 7 should be today. If you have a program running on JDK 7 that needs to work past July of 2022, you should be upgrading to JDK 8 or 11. Before you can upgrade to a new version though, you will need to check that the third-party libraries and tools that your program uses can run on that new version. In many cases, this is simply a matter of upgrading them. But if your program relies on a library that has not been maintained, you might have to find a replacement, which could take some code rewriting. It is also advisable to test thoroughly the new JDK version before putting the upgraded code in production. Although we take pains to maintain backward compatibility, there is always a chance of some feature being deprecated or removed when moving across releases. Updates, on the other hand, are much easier. Updates include performance improvements. They're usually very small between any two updates, but they do add up over time. You can also be forced to update if something changes in the underlying operating system. There are bug fixes, which might or might not be relevant since your application is already running on the current version. Uh, your own IT compliance uh, department is likely to flag out-of-date versions since these updates are lacking security vulnerability fixes. It is not a good idea to have runtimes that have not been updated for a long time for a long time handling your data. But it is possible that your application doesn't expose the vulnerability fixes, right? The vulnerability is fixed. The more relevant change in the update releases are the crypto roadmap updates, since most applications need to communicate securely. Changes in this area trigger most of the complaints that we get where that and some update broke an application. But those changes affect programs doing something dangerous. Changes to the crypto roadmap are things like disabling SSL in favor of TLS. If you were still using SSL by the time we disabled it, you were asking for trouble. And if you were affected, it is quite simple to re-enable SSL until you upgrade your servers, since the changes are disabled by default, but do not remove functionality. Updates are much less risky than upgrades 
most applications just work, and most vendors don't even bother recertifying with each update. In most cases, it is reasonable to apply all updates with minimal testing. Okay, so from what we just saw, in order to get the most value out of your investment in Java and make sound decisions, you will need to get a complete inventory of all the Java runtimes installed in your system. There are several tools out there that could find installations of Java, but you will also need to know who the vendor is and whether there are updates available for each version. You will have to periodically visit a few websites to get that information or register for email alerts for when a new version comes out. This is a routine job better left to a system. You will also need a complete list of Java applications running in your system. Traditional software inventory systems will have a harder time on this one, since some Java applications don't look like a regular application. They might be a jar or an EAR file rather than an executable. Your traditional tools are also likely to miss legacy deployment models like WebStart, where the application is downloaded from the internet at launch time. Finally, you will need to play connect the dots between these two lists. Unless your existing tools are quite specialized for Java applications, it is a safe bet that they will miss this. Without this last component, you won't be able to tell if a runtime is still needed or if it simply was left over from something in the past. You could remove it and find out, but this is like finding furniture in the dark by walking barefoot. It could be painful. Using the new JMS service, you will get the list of Java runtimes, calling out the ones that need to be updated or upgraded, a list of Java applications, and an always current list of which applications use which runtime. Now, how does JMS know this? It relies on a capability available on Oracle JDK runtimes called usage logging. Starting with JDK 7, JDK has had the ability to record and report when an application is launched. If we look into the documentation of this functionality, we will find a sample of the records that gets created whenever the runtime is used. The records contain information on the application and the runtime, including the date and time when it was launched, which system it is being launched from, hostname and IP, and date and time. You also get the name of the jar file or the main class, and if you pass any arguments when you launch, those also get saved. The record includes location and version of the runtime used, and we also save JVM arguments, which could be useful later for debugging. On a common server, you will find one and sometimes more Java runtimes and a few Java applications that use them. If you turn on usage tracking, you will get a record of all the times any of those runtimes is used. But of course, a bunch of local files distributed across your enterprise is not very practical. What we need is a way of getting all those records into a centralized location. We install an agent on each of those systems, and each agent securely sends the data to a centralized place. Once we have the data, we can create reports and pinpoint possible issues and make uh, sense of all of those records. Now, if so far this presentation sounds a bit familiar, it could be because this is not the first time we offer a system that does this. The Java SE subscription has included, since the day it was launched, a product called Java Advanced Management Console, which did what I just described. AMC also communicates with Oracle to get information on which Java versions are up to date. The thing with AMC, though, is that it requires that the customer maintain a couple of servers, one for the application, which runs on WebLogic, and another server for the database, which could be either an Oracle database an Oracle database or MySQL. The Java SE subscription includes a restricted license to use WebLogic for running AMC. And if you don't already own an Oracle database, MySQL doesn't require that you purchase a license. So license cost is not an issue, but you still need to maintain the servers. And if you want to monitor a large number of machines, you might need to set up a cluster of servers for redundancy and manage a load balancer in front of it, you're on the hook for maintaining the servers, managing backups, applying updates to WebLogic, the MC application, and the database. This is okay for some customers, but too complicated for others. So we have been making on an, we have been working on an offer uh, that will pr provide an alternative. JMS provides similar functionality, but using a native cloud application. All the usual goodness that you hear about moving a system to the cloud applies here. 
You still have to install the agents on the managed systems, but the servers are no longer your problem. Oracle will manage the database and you will get updates on the system in real time. You don't have to worry about scaling up if the number of agents increases or how to secure the data so only authorized users can get to it. You can use the same agent to monitor workloads running on-premise, on your Oracle cloud instances, or even on other public clouds. Updates to the system will be rolled for you without any gaps in availability, and you have full control of your data. All the data collected by the service is stored in your own customer tenancy. It is not commingled with the data of any other customer. You get to choose how long to keep it, who sees it, if you want to export it, or if you want to remove it. As with AMC, where you didn't pay for licenses but had to pay for the operation of your servers, JMS usage is included with your Java SE subscription. And if you're running within OCI, you already have all the benefits of Java SE subscription, so all OCI Java workloads can be managed with JMS at no additional licensing cost. You will only be billed for the data storage as you would for any OCI workload. If you don't have an OCI account, you can try one for free. And there is a free tier that will allow you to try out JMS at no cost. JMS is now available in 22 commercial, commercial regions across all over the world. All the locations, as well as government regions, are scheduled to go live in mid-July. And you can't have an introduction without a demo, so please follow me to the browser. Let's go to cloud.oracle.com. If you don't have yet an account, you can create a free account here to try this out. Let's put in login and password. Now I'm going to change to the region that has the sample data. Under Observability and Management, we will find towards the bottom the new Java Management Service. Uh, OCI is, groups things into compartments. We've created a few fleets, which is a collection of managed instances. Let's take a look at how many instances we have in this fleet. It looks here like we added some machines around June 11, perhaps in preparation to this demo. I can look into each one of the instances and see how many Java runtimes they have installed, how many versions. I can find the Java runtimes, the versions, and it will highlight the ones that require an update. I can also see on how many managed instances each one of these is installed. I can take a look at the applications that have been launched in all of the managed instances on any of those runtimes. And as you can expect, I will be able to dig into any of the applications in this example, basic math demo, and see, in this case, on which Java runtimes it has been launched. So we can see that it's been launched in many different versions. I could also take a look and see on which machines it has launched. And as you can imagine, I can slice and dice this data in any way that I want to. And this concludes the recorded portion of the webinar.